Okay, um, so that was an intro to um, glomerular filtration, and now what we are going to do is tubular reabsorption. So what we are going to be doing is we are going to be reabsorbing things from the tube because I just pushed them into the capsule, right? Capsular space. And then they will be going through the proximal convoluted tubule, the loop descending, then ascending, and then the distal convoluted tubule, and then they'll enter the collecting duct. So what we need to do is we need to selectively reabsorb things from the tube back into the bloodstream. Because remember, filtration was general. It's just like pushes anything out that's water soluble and fits through the holes. Okay, so what we are going to be doing is we're going to be reabsorbing things from the tubular fluid filtrate back into the blood, blood plasma specifically. So how much reabsorption do we do? A lot. Um, so generally, and this is just to give you an intro, you do not have to memorize this by any stretch of the imagination. Generally, like if we filter out about eight, 180 liters or 47 gallons per day, we reabsorb 178, 179 of it. Um, and with most of the things we reabsorb like 85 to 100%. Um, urea is a different one. We reabsorb that for some strange reasons that maybe I'll explain in class, maybe not. Um, so we reabsorb, reabsorption is a really, really intense and active process. Um, so basically what we are going to be doing is we are going to be moving stuff from the tube back into the bloodstream. And how do we control what is reabsorbed? Well, Remember way back at the beginning of anatomy, they said, oh, okay, um, you have to memorize simple cuboidal epithelium, and then we're going to tell you that it forms kidney tubules. But at that point, you didn't have any idea what a kidney tubule is. Well, now I'm going to tell you that this is what they were talking about. These cells that form the tube, proximal and distal convoluted tubule, and it changes a little bit as you go from proximal to distal and the loop. But they're simple cuboidal epithelium primarily. Um, and I know we didn't tell you that they had microvilli on it. It's just because you can't see that very well in histology slides. And these cells have all different kinds of transport proteins on them. And um, the microvilli give them more transport proteins and therefore more ability to move things. So um, if they have carriers, pumps, channels for certain things, then things are going to be able to move back from the tube into the extracellular fluid, which they call the paratubular space, and then back into the cells. So basically what this is, is what we learned about at the beginning of the semester um, called epithelial transport, remember? Because we'll move across the apical surface and then across the basal surface and then into the extracellular fluid and then into the blood plasma. So epithelial transport. And so the epithelial transport mechanisms that we're going to talk about here are primarily the ones that you've already learned. We're just putting them into the context of the kidney. So how do you move things? Um, kind of, we go back to the cheapest, fastest way that we can idea. So if you can get it to move in passively, sure, definitely do that. Of course, that depends on its solubility, whether there's a channel, if it's um, an ion, and then also its concentration gradient. So sometimes this will work and sometimes it won't. Um, if it won't and you still want it, you can do active solute reabsorption, like using um, a carrier or using a pump. Um, and when you do that, you're paying for something that you want back in the bloodstream. And you'll do that if the concentration doesn't favor it. Um, and then what about water? Well, generally speaking, water is going to move by osmosis because you worked really hard to move solutes. And when you move a whole bunch of solutes, you will create a concentration gradient for water, and then it will move back in by osmosis. So when we start talking about water moving, water will follow the solutes that you already worked really hard to move. Okay, so keep that in mind. Okay, so let's talk about reabsorption of a few things. We're not going to talk about reabsorption of everything, but we're going to go through glucose reabsorption because that sounds really important. We're going to go through sodium reabsorption because sodium not only is, of course, an ion that you need in your extracellular and intracellular fluids for reasons that we've been discussing all semester long, but also that what sodium does, water tries to follow. 
and then we will talk about water reabsorption and then a few other little things. Of course, there's way more than this that you reabsorb, but this is enough to get you started thinking about it. Okay, so let's talk about glucose reabsorption. You already know this. So how do I reabsorb glucose? Generally speaking, glucose is, of course, um, not generally speaking, it is water soluble and so it gets filtered out, it fits through the holes, okay? So, and then I want to reabsorb it. And how much glucose would you like to reabsorb? Realizing that glucose is cell money. I wanna reabsorb all the glucose, if at all possible. So normally 100% of the glucose is reabsorbed. Now, if you had so much glucose in your bloodstream that tons of it got pushed into the tube, you might not be able to reabsorb all of it because you use carrier proteins for the reabsorption mechanisms. And the reabsorption mechanism that you use here is one that you already learned for glucose. We learned it at the intestine, but now let's put it here. It is secondary active transport or secondary active co-transport. I move glucose in to these tubular cells. So this is where the P is and this is where I wanna get glucose, right? So what I wanna do is I wanna move it back in, but I don't wanna pay for it if I can avoid it. So I'm going to move it down um, sodium's electrochemical gradient using this um, carrier protein that has a site for sodium and a site for glucose, secondary active transport. Then I'm gonna move it across the basal surface um, with a um, carrier protein and then it goes back into the bloodstream. And then of course the sodium potassium pump fixes the sodium that you brought in. You learned this all the way at the beginning of the semester. So secondary active transport or co-transport followed by facilitated diffusion, okay? But this is a carrier, so it's subject to saturation. So if you get so much glucose in here that the carriers can't move at all before it actually makes it down into the rest of the tube, then you're gonna end up peeing out some glucose like a diabetic person who um, either um, can't or isn't regulating their blood glucose um, uh, well, um, you're going to have what we call glycosuria, which is um, sugar, and glu glucose in your urine, which will, as it goes through the tube, I want to remind you, so if you push a whole bunch of glucose out and then you can't bring all of it back in, then you're going to have glucose going through the tube. And as it goes through the tube, since it's a non-penetrating solute, it's going to exert an osmotic pull on water. And so as all that glucose goes through the tube, you are going to end up pulling water into the tube and therefore making more urine. And that is called polyuria. And of course, you guys have known that not only glycosuria, but polyuria are characteristics of diabetes, both type one and type two. Okay, so that's glucose reabsorption. Now, other nutrients and some vitamins are also reabsorbed by a similar mechanism, usually co-transport with sodium. It's not always sodium, but a lot of times it's co-transport with sodium. So um, like amino acids, lactic acid, and some of your water soluble vitamins use a similar mechanism for reabsorption. So that is glucose reabsorption.